he pulled off the most daring crime spree in South African history. He thought he was going to make a lot of money very fast and then vanish. A top cop turns into the country's most celebrated criminal. He was a captain at a very young age. He was intelligent. He had a good brain. A mastermind who became a folk hero for a nation in turmoil. It was an amazing story. Amazing part of South African criminal history. Johannesburg, South Africa's largest city and the heart of the country's gold mining industry. A summer morning in 1983, a day the city would never forget. Trick Style was working as a teller at the Trust Bank. I was not busy at that stage, it was quite quiet, I was sitting and the next moment I saw these guys coming in. Three strange-looking men walked in cool as ice. It was a holdup. Trix was struck by the bizarre disguise one of the men was wearing. He was a big moustache and his black hair and he was wearing glasses with a canvas bag like a sports bag. Another man, also in an outlandish getup, approached Trix and politely asked her to fill his bag with cash. I wasn't threatened at all by it. There was nothing in his, his manner or whatever to make me feel scared. He just asked me in a normal kind of voice to please hand over the money, not doing anything funny. Uh, I hand him all the notes I have in, in my counter and give it to him. The bank's panic button was just below Trix's counter. But the robber insisted that she keep her hands away from the desk. I realized then that they know exactly how our security system works. In less than two minutes, the men were gone, along with thousands of dollars in cash. There was no sh shots or anything, uh, just calm and normal, like any other client coming in, you know, do some business at the teller and walk out again. That's what it was like. Once the robbers were gone, Trix called for help. I watched them till they reached the street and then I pushed my panic button. Little did she know, she was playing right into the robber's hands. As police gathered clues at the trust bank, they were completely unaware that a second bank robbery was taking place just a few streets over. And there was more to come. As police raced to the second robbery, yet a third was being committed just around the corner. And as they arrived too late for the third, around the next corner, there was a fourth. Authorities had never seen anything like it before. And this was just the beginning. There would be one, maybe two, sometimes three a day. And it was always three white guys. Every time they were armed, but nobody was shot and we started to suspect it was the same gang. In one summer, the gang hit over 20 banks, often more than one a day, and in record time. Three robberies in a matter of an hour. It's never been done in this country before or since. The whole story is over in a few short months. I mean, it's a very dramatic story in that sense. It's action all the way. Authorities were determined to hunt down the audacious bank hoppers. Little did they know, the mastermind behind the crime spree was once one of their own. November 1983. South Africa was gripped by the most infamous spree of bank robberies the country had ever seen. With speed and precision, the gang robbed up to four banks a day. They seemed unstoppable. The police just couldn't keep up with them. The leader of the gang was no ordinary criminal. 
In another life, he'd been a brilliant and high-ranking police officer. His name was Andre Stander. Growing up in Johannesburg, Stander followed his father into the police force, where he quickly became a rising star. Andre was a captain at a very young age, I believe uh, the youngest captain at that stage. Highly intelligent person, very good commander. His members had a lot of respect for him. On all accounts, Stander was a stand-up guy. He wanted everybody to like him. I wouldn't see him as a typical armed robber, a guy who committed bank robberies. Definitely not. But South Africa was in the throes of apartheid. Police were using brutality to protect the white minority rule. In 1976, Stander was drawn into a bloody attack on the Soweto Township. He started hating everything the police stood for. So, as authorities continued to suppress the blacks, Stander secretly began fleecing the whites. Best friend and fellow officer Cor Van Deventer noticed changes in Stander's behavior. He can spend money like it's water. In the late 70s, six years before the Johannesburg spree, there was a series of bank raids 400 miles away in Durban. I remembered at the time about the robberies that I read about in the papers and heard over television. And all of a sudden, you know, I could just fit Andre into that picture. Van Deventer's hunch had been right. At work, Stander fought the poor. In his private life, he was stealing from the rich. On his day off, he would simply catch a, an aircraft uh, from Johannesburg to Durban. That's about a two-hour flight. And he'd go and rob banks. He'd maybe rob one or two banks per day. He'd drive back to Durban Airport, he'd get back on the aircraft, fly back to Johannesburg, and he'd go home, presumably at the end of the day, as if he'd just had an ordinary day like anyone else. Van Deventer confronted his friend about his suspicions. Stander confessed, but wouldn't give up his sideline. For the next 15 or 18 months, uh, I honestly tried to talk Andre out of it, although he at one stage seriously tried to get me involved in his robberies, but um, I, I just couldn't imagine myself uh, putting a robbery. After months of deliberation, Cor Van Deventer turned his friend in. Cor had gone to his superiors and they'd laid a trap for Andre Stander. They'd obviously had contact with the Durban Authority. They knew there was a bank robbery uh, had taken place in Durban. So when Andre Stander returns to Johannesburg International Airport, he was arrested in the arrivals lounge. In August 1980, Andre Stander was found guilty of 28 charges, including armed robbery and fraud. He was sentenced to 75 years in jail. But this mastermind's rebellion against authority was just getting started. While incarcerated at Zondewater Maximum Security Prison, Stander befriended Alan Hale and Patrick McCall. Both were convicted bank robbers. It was a meeting of minds that would go down in history. Here was Andre Stander, and he was mixing with the experts all of a sudden. And he was an expert, if you like. So they all brought something to the party. They realized that together they could achieve greatness, I suppose. But first, they needed to break out of prison. On August 11th, 1983, they put their ingenious escape plan into action. McCall and Stander decided that they were going to feign injury, so they got themselves a visit to a local physiotherapist. Accompanied by three guards, they pretended they were in urgent need of treatment. When they got to the physiotherapist, they overpowered the guards that were accompanying them and simply escaped. After Stander and McCall broke free, they stormed into the prison workshop where Hale had been taken for training. They freed him at gunpoint. The whole gang was now out and on the run. Police searched everywhere for the escaped prisoners, but the men had vanished. The Stander gang had gone underground. Holed up in a safe house, they prepared for the biggest crime spree South Africa had ever seen. 
he probably recognised that his career was going to be pretty short-lived, so he had to rob a lot of banks, get a lot of money together as quickly as possible. As an escaped felon, Stander had to be extra careful in concealing his identity. He always made sure that he was well disguised, so it took a long time for the police to get a decent picture of Andre Stander and his gang. Disguises became their forte. Stander, Hale and McCall wore bizarre wigs, false mustaches and sunglasses. There was no way to know what they looked like underneath. It was difficult to identify him as actually Andre Stander. They took just as much care in their robberies. Every bank raid was meticulously planned, and each robber had a specific role. One of the gang would stand at the door, the other two would go to the counter and demand the money. Stander was well-versed in the art of bank robbery, but it wasn't just the experience he clocked up in Durban that made him so capable. He must have used his police know-how because he was an investigating officer and he would have investigated bank robberies. So he would, knew, he would know how banks operated. As in the trust bank, Stander knew exactly where panic buttons were situated. And he could make sure that tellers like Trick Style didn't set off any alarms until the gang was safely out of the bank. And he used his information very successfully as we know now. When it came to the getaway, Stander's thorough knowledge of police operations kept him one step ahead of his pursuers. He knew exactly which roads police would use to get to each bank, and he simply avoided them. They would hit one bank in one suburb, and then move very quickly in quite a souped up car, and gun hit another. So when the police were investigating the first one, he'd already done another two. Robbing more than one bank in a day may have seemed foolhardy, but it was all part of Standers' M.O. A brazen game of cat and mouse across Johannesburg. The bank hopping spree became the talk of South Africa, and as the months passed, the gang just got better and faster. Stander was on a roll, but the mastermind knew it couldn't go on forever. He thought he was going to make a lot of money, very fast, and then vanish. Stander was at the height of his criminal career. He thought he was untouchable, but his own cockiness would take him down. At the end of 1983, Ex-cop Andre Stander and his gang had robbed over 20 banks and netted almost $100,000 in just four months. Stander's faultless planning and execution had police running in circles. I think he wanted, also wanted to prove to us that we won't be able to caught, caught up with him. And I think he was also playing a game with us. Although Stander, Hale and McCall topped South Africa's most wanted list, they didn't believe in laying low. They rented houses all over the place, luxury houses. They bought cars. There's talk that they um, stand again when they were holed up. They had call girls uh, coming regularly. Stander was reveling in the fruits of his success. And soon, confidence turned into cockiness. He got a yellow Porsche that he seemed to like to drive around in. Well, then as now, if you drive a yellow Porsche, you tend to attract people's attention. So in one sense, he was not trying to be as inconspicuous as other people would be. As the toll of plundered banks mounted, public fascination grew. And in a nation torn apart by fighting, the anti-authoritarian cop became an icon. The public were hugely behind him. We didn't try and make him a hero. But the public did. They thought he was a hero. It was just the aura and the way he committed these crimes that got them right behind. Circulations of newspapers went up hugely. And uh, readers were clamoring to find out what was going to happen next. But the infamy was going to Stander's head. It was only a matter of time before the mastermind made his first mistake. 
There was one robbery that they committed where there were hidden cameras and they didn't realize they were being filmed. One morning in January 1984, Stander, Hale, and McCall walked into a branch of Barclays Bank in Johannesburg. For them, it was just another ordinary robbery. But Stander had made an error. He usually wore sunglasses to conceal his eyes. Today, he'd forgotten. The bank had recently installed new video cameras in case the Stander gang should strike. They caught clear pictures of Andre Stander's face. When their photographs were published in the media, they realized that the writing really was on the wall and that their, their time out of prison was going to be short-lived unless they got out of South Africa. The Stander gang's anonymity had been blown. It was time to make their final getaway. And it was then, it seems, that Andre Stander had the idea of buying a yacht, sailing to the States and escaping that way. The gang would sail away throwing the police off their trail and taking their ill-gotten gains with them. They pooled their cash to purchase a luxury vessel called the Lily Rose. The plan was to sail to Florida, take a long Caribbean cruise, then sell the yacht and split the proceeds. The men would then start new lives in the U.S. Standard decided he would go on ahead and prepare for the gang's great escape. With a suitcase full of cash and a stolen passport, Stander flew to Florida. Hale and McCall would sail over once he had everything set up. Stander went to the States to set up the receiving end of the deal. And it was while he was in the States that their house of cards collapsed. Back in Johannesburg, the Lily Rose was dead in the water. Police had impounded the yacht following a tip-off. They were closing in on the gang. A call girl who knew the robbers pointed investigators to the safe house where Patrick McCall was holed up. Armed police were on their way. They arrived uh, in a Johannesburg safe house and McCall was inside and they asked him to come out and he didn't and there was a dramatic shootout. McCall didn't make it out alive. Hale wasn't taking any chances. He slipped out of the country, but nowhere was safe. Because of their exploits, uh, they were becoming well-known internationally because obviously the international media were picking up the story, and in the story of the Stander Gang was being published around the world. In the US, Stander had no idea what had happened to McCall and Hale nor was he aware that he was being watched. South African police had alerted authorities worldwide. His face was all over international law enforcement databases. Stander thought he'd be out of harm's way in Florida. He was dead wrong. <laughs> Andre Stander was South Africa's most wanted criminal after carrying out the biggest bank hopping spree in history. He assumed he'd be safe outside the country, but authorities worldwide were on the lookout. When the South African police authorities realized that the Stander gang were planning to leave the country, then Interpol would have been notified. Using a stolen passport, Stander had slipped out of the country and flown to Florida. He thought he'd be able to start a new life. He never imagined that even in the U.S., he'd be under continuous surveillance. It was only a matter of time before police sprang on him. On February 2nd, 1984, Stander was on his way to arrange a place to dock the gang's yacht. He was completely unaware that he was walking into a police trap. A SWAT team surrounded him. Would Andre Stander ever have gone quietly? The events tell the story that no, he wouldn't. He had no intention of going quietly. In fact, he was going to do anything but. 
When the armed unit approached him, guns drawn, Stander lunged for his pistol, but it was hopeless. He was shot three times. He died instantly. It had to end that way, eventually. Um, but I, I was sad when I learned of it, yeah. Maybe he decided that he was going to go down fighting. Maybe he wanted to go down in history. And in one sense, he has. It was the perfect ending to the Stander gang. Alan Hale, the only surviving member of the legendary Stander gang, was eventually tracked down in London and extradited to South Africa, where he's still in prison today. The story of Andre Stander and his gang has since become a great South African legend. It was an amazing story, amazing part of South African criminal history. The mastermind who rebelled against a violent and unjust police force will always be remembered. Intelligent man, a very good friend, very likable, and unfortunately very greedy, which led to his demise. Thank you.